Let's talk about the differences between render in place and bounce audio in Cubase 12. They do some very different things and it's easy to confuse one for the other. Hey, what's going on everybody? My name is Bobby Bailo and I'm the mixing and mastering engineer at Raytown Productions. If you're looking for some new plugins to help you inspire some creativity or just help you get a better sound, check out the description because I have a free downloadable PDF that contains my favorite free mixing and mastering plugins. It has every kind of plugin you could imagine. It even has some samples. So if that sounds interesting to you, check that out. Go and grab your free copy. Let me show you where the bounce and render in place features are in Cubase. So to enable them, you have to select two clips in a track, and then you go up to audio, and bounce selection is the first one right here. So if you click that, it's going to ask you if you want to replace the events. Typically, you say yes, and then it does something to this audio, and we're going to talk about what exactly it does in a second. Now, to render in place, you come up to edit, render in place, and you, once you've set it up, you can just do render with current settings, but typically, you want to do render settings. Now, this is where a lot of people get confused because there are so many options here, and we're going to talk about what these do. But first... Let's talk about the bounce selection and what that's actually doing to the audio. Anytime you do bounce selection, all it's going to do is replace all the clips that you've selected. So let's select these, go to bounce, and it's going to combine them. That does not bake in any of the channel settings. So if we have an EQ set up here and we're doing stuff, if we had the volume adjusted here, if we have panning, none of that information gets encoded or baked into a bounced file. The same goes for any inserts. None of these will be added to these, this audio file. The only thing that will get baked into this bounced audio file is if you have any offline processing. What is offline processing? That's if you come up here and you go to process and you do something here, okay? So if we open the direct offline processing tab, you can add in plugins where, let's say you wanna add a distortion, right? So let's put on Abbey Road Saturator. Okay, so let's saturate this audio. We can listen to it, right? It's all distorted now. If you apply this in offline processing mode, you can see that the waveform has changed, okay? Now, if you go to bounce selection, it's going to bake that in, okay? So if the waveform isn't changing, see, so now it's permanently on the track. We can't get it off, okay? Something else to consider is that if you do any time warping or audio warp, as it's called in Cubase, so free warp, we come over here and stretch this out, you can see that all the audio data here is changing, like the picture of it. That means that when we bounce this, it's going to permanently keep these time stretches in the audio. Same goes with very audio. So if you are tuning vocals or something, um, and you make these adjustments, and you go to bounce selection, it's going to bake it into the track. Okay, now, render in place is a totally different story, okay? So if we select an audio track, we go to render in place, edit, render in place. We have a few different options, okay? And this is where I think a lot of people get confused. So we have different modes, and basically that's going to determine how it treats each individual clip on a track or each event. Then you have processing, which tells Cubase how much stuff to bake into each event track or each clip. Then you have features like tail mode, which allows you to basically add a tail on the end of all the events. And that's nice if you have like a reverb effect or something that you're trying to bake into a track so that you capture that reverb tail. You can just tell it to, oh, add in two bars and three beats or whatever. Uh, you can change this to seconds and say every five seconds or whatever you want. Bit depth, which is just whatever you, you should just be whatever you have your session set to. And then you can choose different names and stuff like that, okay? But basically, render in place will bake in any different EQs you have, volume adjustments, panning, all that stuff into the track, okay? And you can't go backwards, right? So the different processing methods allow you to choose to what extent do you want to include things in with this final track. 
So let's start with what dry is. Dry says transfer channel settings. What that's going to do is basically make a new track with all these same inspector settings and automation and everything and put it below whatever track you have that it's from, okay? It's not going to bake in the settings into the track. It's just going to make a duplicate of the track. So you basically can get the exact same thing just by going to duplicate. Channel settings is going to include everything in the channel settings. So what are those things? That's everything in here, in your inspector. It's going to include any of the pre-filters. It's going to include any of the EQ you use, any of the inserts, pre and post. It's going to include automation that you might have written for the track, um, but it won't include send effects, okay? That's something totally different. So this will also include panning. So if you have something pan hard left you and you render in place, it's going to just give you a file that it has the audio data on the left side. Um, and then any volume adjustments you make in the inspector tab, okay? Complete signal path means that from this channel all the way to the output bus that it's assigned to. So if this goes to a drum bus, since it's a hi-hat track, Anything on the drum bus will be applied directly to this track as well. If you have automation on the drum bus, it's going to be applied here as well. So it goes all the way to the end. And if you have mastering plugins and stuff on your output bus, that will be applied as well. Now, the final option we have is complete signal path plus master effects. So the only difference between these two is that now it's going to include all of your sends. Okay, so it's going to it's going to render that any of the send information back onto this track. Okay, so if you want an exact clone for how this track sounds when it's played back, including all of your send effects, that's what you're gonna wanna choose. Let's talk about what this mode does because this can really streamline your ability to use render in place if you're exporting tracks. So if you have it as separate events, every single event, every clip that you have in your track will be exported as a separate WAV file. Let's see what happens. Render, and you'll see we're gonna get four separate clips with all of our inspector settings baked in. There we go. And if you look, you can see that each one is named differently, so we have four different WAV files that were exported. Okay, if we do the same thing, this time let's do block events. Render. Now, it's gonna combine anything that's touching into a single WAV file. Okay, so now we have two WAV files, and then finally, if we do as one event and hit render, it's gonna give us one WAV file that starts at the beginning of the first clip and ends at the end of the, the last clip, unless we specify a tail. Then it will add in some amount after that. So when should you consider using render in place? Well, render in place is great if you want to consolidate and archive your entire project. Um, it's basically like uh, mixed down audio, but you can do it within the session. So then you have a copy of your original track and then you have the fully exported version of it below it. So that's very helpful. It's also really nice to use render in place if you have MIDI instruments that are kind of CPU intensive. Select all the MIDI notes and then do render in place and it will literally just print out a audio version of that MIDI information. Then you can go in and disable or bypass those virtual instruments. And for using bounce selection, I find that's usually helpful after I edit a bunch of audio. It'll combine all the different clips that are formed during the editing process and just make them one nice consistent look. So then to quickly summarize the differences between bounce selection and render in place, basically bounce selection will combine any of the clips that you select and then it will apply offline processing and bake that into the file. It does not do any inspector modifications. So if you change volume, panning, have any inserts or sends or any of that stuff that is not included into the file when you do bounce selection. Again, only offline processing, audio warp, or very audio. Render in place will do all of the stuff that bounce selection does, plus it will add in any adjustments you have to your inspector tab, okay? So if you have panning, volume, inserts, send effects, any of that stuff, it'll bake it into the final file. 
And then you have those different selections under the mode option to help you fine tune how you want to render it down into the individual audio files. So hopefully that helps demystify the differences between bounce selection and render in place. I know it's something that I had to keep looking up because I wasn't sure what gets included and what doesn't. As a quick reminder, don't forget to download your free copy of my favorite free mixing and mastering plugins. There's a link to that in the description. And with that, I want to thank you so much for your time and attention today and hope to see you in another video.